uh, everyone is very much interested in climate change. And uh, you are the, the, the experts, so to speak, because your countries are greatly affected by climate change. So uh, I, if I introduce you, I will be too verbose. <laughs> so I would like each of you to introduce yourselves. We, we are going to start with Ambassador Silmiza Hussein, because I understand that she has uh, a, um, a vote that she has to place or a, a conference that she has to be in. So Ambassador Silmiza Hussein, can you please introduce yourself and uh, then take it from there? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. And uh, thank you for having me and uh, giving me the opportunity to engage in this dialogue. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, so uh, just to be clear, uh, you just want me to introduce myself at this moment and then uh, we would come back sure. for the interaction, correct? Sure. Okay, so my name is Tilmiza and uh, Tilmiza Hussein, and I'm the permanent representative of the uh, uh, of, of the Republic of Maldives to the United Nations, and uh, I'm also uh, the non-resident ambassador of the Maldives to to the United States, and uh, I. Uh, I look forward to today's discussion, which is of a very important topic for my country and for other small island developing states. So I look forward for a fruitful discussion today, Marilyn. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, Ambassador Bergdis, uh, Bergdis Elert Dotir uh, from uh, Iceland, would you please also introduce yourself? I had the pleasure of visiting your country <laughs> some time ago. I have not yet been to the Maldives, but uh, after confinement, it sounds like a great destination. <laughs> okay, Ambassador Bergit, uh, Elot Dotier, please. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Mellon, for introducing uh, us and to um, inviting us to this very important panel. And I'm so glad to meet the my colleague Hussein, uh, who is now at the UN, where I used to be uh, before I came to Washington, and it's a, uh, it's uh, I also had the privilege to working with uh, with your predecessors. And even if Iceland and the Maldives were both islands, but I think, and we are affected by climate change, but they're the kind of the comparison ends. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, I would. I have not been to the Maldives, but I would very much like to go to this, you know, paradise-like islands. Uh, and uh, but I'm I'm very much looking forward to this today. I mean, I'm the ambassador of Iceland to the United States, uh, uh, and I've been here since 2019. And uh, and I've just felt uh, that in the United States uh, there is. Uh, kind of a thirst of, for knowledge and understanding of this climate crisis and, and to compare with other countries on, you know, best practices and how can we work ourselves out of this crisis. So I, I very much welcome this opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Ambassador. So we are going to go right now the, right into the, the topic. Uh, how does the climate change uh, affect uh, Iceland? How does the climate change affect the Maldives? So maybe we will start with the Maldives. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. First of all, uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and those of you who are watching from near and far, a very good afternoon to all of you. Let me also begin by uh, thanking the organizers and uh, you for moderating the panel uh, for this interactive dialogue and providing us with the opportunity to engage in this important issue. I hope we can change uh, quickly the fact that you haven't been to the Maldives. So we, we would be able to change that after this discussion, maybe we could have another discussion on how to further that agenda. Well, since the inception of the UN Framework of Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, the global climate discourse has been uh, politically a turbulent one. We have overcome many hurdles and failures over the last three decades to finally uh, reach the Paris Agreement, which is a symbol of uh, global unity and progressive climate action, and most importantly, uh, a symbol of hope. 
Paris Agreement was a sign of hope for small island developing states like mine. Therefore, with the shift in global politics, we were both uneasy and alarmed. Alarmed by the unraveling of the Paris Agreement. Uh, accounting, to, accounting for almost uh, a third of excess carbon dioxide in the global atmosphere. The climate crisis cannot be resolved without the United States at the table. For small countries like us, this means losing our homes, our future, and I do not say this lightly. Therefore, when we heard the news of United States uh, coming back, we warmly welcome the recommitment of the United States, not just to the Paris Agreement, but also to the 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature goal and net zero global emissions by 2050, which uh, was announced at the Global Adaptation Summit uh, recently. Of course, we do acknowledge the strong climate action led in the US at the state level and uh, at the local government and the private sector, which has resulted in a significant drop, significant drop in the greenhouse gas emissions over the last few years. Building on these efforts, we hope to welcome an even more ambitious target from the US in the near future joining other major countries who have committed to, um, new, uh, to net neutrality by 2050. As a constructive rather than a confrontational player internationally, the US also has the potential to reinvigorate the global shift to greener and more sustainable economies. We need to see this constructive spirit in action now during this critical period of economic recovery providing the required support to the vulnerable countries. And we are seeing this um, and we are seeing very encouraging signs and we're very hopeful by this. The, the need for action is illustrated by science and it's backed by science. 2020 has been one of the warmest years recorded and over 50 million people have been directly impacted by the effects of climate change last year. To make matters worse, these climate impacts have been further exacerbated by the global pandemic that we are going through right now. So we need to align not only the um, nationally determined contributions, but also the COVID-19 re response and recovery efforts with the 1.5 degree goal, which is critical to ensure we reach the global net neutrality by 2050. Um, it should come as no surprise what is most important to small island developing states on the climate agenda right now is securing access to adequate climate financing. Increasing intensity of climate impacts coupled with socioeconomic repercussions from the pandemic have placed SIDS in an even more vulnerable situation than before. Uh, from the recent reports, uh, we are seeing that the projections are indicating that the 100 billion goal is insufficient to deliver the climate action required and enable sustainable recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. And so it is clear that we need a new collective goal. And we hope that we can commence this in COP26 later this year. This week here at the UN, uh, we are continuing the work of uh, Commission on Status of Women. And as we continue to reaffirm fundamental rights to gender equality, it is critical not only to address the gender differentiated vulnerabilities and impacts of climate change, but also look at ways to ways of um, empowering the billions of women and girls in the world to fully realize their potential as agents of change. Gender equality is central to resolving the climate crisis and to achieve our sustainable development aspirations. Recognizing that each country has different needs for climate financing resources must also be tailored to effectively and efficiently deliver results on ground. For example, a country like mine, uh, which is an archipelagic country, 
um, where our population is spread across hundreds of islands. Uh, Maldives is 1,200 islands spread across the equator. A centralized approach to adaptation will not work. We need coastal protection, resilient infrastructure, and water security to be provided to all the inhabited islands. At the same time, a coral reef protection and restoration, implementing nature-based and other adaptation solutions need to be at large scale as well. These factors, once again, tie in with the issue of availability of adequate climate finance. And uh, with the devastating uh, economic impact of COVID-19 in our country, we do not have uh, domestic resources to scale up adaptation action within the limited time that we have. Even at global level, uh, despite the increase in global public financing available for adaptation, the adaptation financing gap is not closing. Therefore, um, I think we would need a breakthroughs. A breakthrough for us would be ability to urgently access uh, public financing that is commensurate with our adaptation needs. So we would need a model which is a blend model that can mobilize both private and public financing. And But accessing public financing for small island developing states is also not easy because we can never reach economies of scale. So we would need uh, tailored models for small states like ours. While our commitment to overcoming the pandemic is unwavering, combating the adverse effects of climate change at the same time will be a mountain that is very steep to climb. Therefore, at this juncture, an integrated approach is necessary to address climate change and gender issues concurrently. Gender gaps have widened even further with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have been talking about this the past two weeks here at the UN, uh, it's with the CSW going on. Uh, we need to place even more onerous, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has actually placed even more onerous burden on women and girls, while economic opportunities continue to shrink the Maldives has actively been engaged in numerous initiatives aiming to further integrate gender perspective in the climate discourse. Uh, currently, along with Costa Rica, we are co-leading the coalition on feminist action for climate justice within the Generation Equality Forum. The work of the coalition aims to produce a list of focused and concrete actions that can deliver maximum results and formulating principles to inform and guide these actions. We believe one of the concrete action areas that can maximize results in increasing direct access to financing for gender just climate solutions. In particular, for organize, organizations that are led by women and girls at the grassroots and rural levels, enabling women to lead the transition to sustainable green economies and improving data collection and analysis are also key action areas which are being considered uh, in this uh, in, in our discussions i encourage everyone interested to engage and contribute as we are preparing for the first meeting of the forum at the end of this month which is next week Due to the current state of affairs, uh, the uh, I, I don't want to be too long, uh, too long. So to conclude, uh, due to the current state of affairs, uh, we know the the path to COP may seem a bit nebulous. However, under the able leadership and guidance of the United Kingdom as the incoming COP president and with the revived constructive spirit of the United States, I am hopeful that we can forge new alliances in climate diplomacy to overcome these challenges and to deliver ambitious outcomes in Glasgow. Thank you. I'm sure that climate change affects uh, Iceland just as much, but maybe in different ways. So Ambassador Bergis, Elat Dottir is going to uh, tell us all about it. Thank you. Yes, thank you uh, so much. And, and very many thanks to my colleague from the Maldives. And I, I want to um, thank her especially for raising the issue of gender in all of this. I will not touch upon that in, in what I wanted to uh, bring to the table here today. But 
but it's an it's a very very important aspect of all this and um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for that uh, so um, as I said, I'm 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 thrilled to speak here today. It's a it's a topic that's very not only close to my heart, but the, the government of Iceland and and just how to turn the tide on climate change and and why the Paris Agreement is so vital uh, on the path to to lower the impact of global warming and um, and I, uh, we feel that for some time now we have been facing a planetary emergency. Uh, a crisis like no other we have experienced, uh, the climate crisis. And as you all know, and, and as, as, as a younger and wiser generation, uh, we do need to act now before it's too late. And, and uh, my colleague uh, from the Maldives also underlined some of the issues, which I think are, are much more devastating in, in, in her parts of the world than, than in, in some other places. I mean, so but we have to we have to work together to save our planet and and we need to cooperate every country and and all all of us we need to participate in in and breaking our habits that have actually brought us here and and now i'm of course talking about the habits of us in the western part of the world who you know who are actually the ones um who uh, bear the blame so to speak uh, but but the consequences are felt elsewhere often so in our view, uh, technology is key. Uh, we need to find you know, new green and clean solutions. And, and these are emerging uh, by the day and, and give us hope. Um, so we are truly um, think we can do this by trusting the science and, and uh, we are very committed to that. Uh, but, uh, but the Paris Agreement is important because no country alone will solve this crisis. Um, and uh, we must work together on commitments that are based on science and, and turned into policies by our governments and acted upon by all of us. Um, and uh, we just need to, to reach the goals of the Paris Court. But as mentioned, I mean, not even that is enough. Uh, we, need to, we need to be more ambitious than the Paris Accord. So, uh, so that will be interesting to see what people bring to the table in Glasgow, as, as, as was mentioned here earlier. Um, I mean, we are doing uh, in Iceland what we can do uh, to reach our goals. We uh, be it green energy, green transportation, reforestation, uh, fighting for our oceans. Um, and uh, we are developing technology that allows us to capture carbon from the atmosphere and turn it into stone. I will mention that uh, um, a, a bit uh, a bit again. Um, and I do hope that uh, this uh, introduction by myself and, and my colleague from the Maldives will spark a discussion uh, on necessary climate action. Uh, and uh, I would very much love to hear from the students thoughts and ideas, <laughs> even frustrations. So, so I'm, I'm very much looking uh, forward to the second part of this, uh, where we will hopefully be bombarded with questions. Um, I mean, I mentioned the Paris Agreement, which of course is a, a landmark in the multilateral climate change process, because it is the first international binding agreement that brings all nations into a common cause to undertake ambitious efforts to combat the climate change and, and adapt to its effects. And as my, do you hear me now? I'm sorry for this, but there's a lady in, in my uh, ear that says my battery is high. So I'm very sorry for this. But uh, I mean, but what, what I wanted to say is to just underline what my colleague just said, that we very much welcome the Biden-Harris administration re-engagement with other nations on the climate crisis uh, and, and the United States return to the Paris Accord because we need the US to be an active leader and advocate for changes. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so we are very, we have been following very much the new administration's uh, prioritization to climate change across all institutions and all policies, uh, domestic, international security and trade. So. Uh, for that, for us, this is a very positive development. Uh, and uh, but if we just take a short trip, uh, mental trip to Iceland, uh, maybe some of you have been following the volcanic eruption uh, that's been uh, taking place there. 
Um, and um, but but I will not be talking about the eruption, which is not very um, good for the uh, climate because uh, cl uh, volcanic eruptions can be very destructive when it comes to climate. Uh, but as I wanted to tell you that climate change has already had visible effects on my country. Uh, scientists say that we are losing more than 15 square miles of glaciers each year. Uh, scientists counted over 300 glaciers in Iceland in 2000 to 2017, and 56 of these are gone. But I mean, melting glaciers in Iceland, should that be a worry for the rest of the world? Uh, it should. I mean, warming over two degrees Celsius will likely melt most uh, mid-latitude glaciers, be it in the Alps, New Zealand, the Rocky Mountains, and other places. Himalayan glaciers could shrink greatly in a warmer world, and that would affect the water supply of, of a big part of humankind. The ice sheets of Greenland and West Antarctica will reach the point of unstoppable melting affecting sea level rise of up to a dozen meters or more. And, and that is, of course, something that the Maldives will be very much affected by. Um, and people all over the world are already already feeling the effect of higher waters and changes in weather systems, ocean currents, and uh, more vulnerability to storm surges and disasters. So retreating glaciers is, in fact, a matter that we should all worry about. Um, as you know, Iceland is uh, an island surrounded, surrounded by the North Atlantic, so the ocean is very important. It is our livelihood. Um, fishing contributes around 30% of Iceland's export, and, and, and that is under threat from climate change. Um, impacts of climate change are less visible to us in the ocean, uh, but these changes are no less profound then the oceans are not just getting warmer, but they're also getting more acid. Um, what is referred to ocean acidification is a reduction in the pH of the ocean and over an extended period of time, which, which happens because of uptake of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And I mean, uh, the oceans help us here, but, but to a detrimental effect. I mean, they take up um, around a quarter of the carbon emissions and soak up 90% of the SX excess heat. So that's a big. And, um, but this has an impact on the marine ecosystem. Um, it causes tropicals, um, for example, heat waves in tropical seas cause coral bleaching. Um, and, uh, and the sea ice is receding rapidly in the north. Uh, so, I mean, these, these trends will, can have devastating effect on fisheries and livelihood, uh, not only in Iceland, but of people around the world. And, and you know, not to mention the whole plastic issue, which, which we all know of and, and is, is, uh, is killing marine and coastal wildlife and, and damaging habitats and, and interfering with fishing and, and all of that. So, I mean, that's, that's something that uh, the Icelandic government has been very much focused on, as many other governments around the world. So maybe we should sometimes think twice before we throw our plastic straws into the waste or even use them. So, but you know, um, so what, what, are, what is the Icelandic government doing? Um, we have committed to reduce emissions by 55% by 2030 and hopefully reaching carbon neutrality by 2040. What is helping us that we are blessed, we have renewable resources which are using, used for heating and for uh, electricity. So most, most, most of that is, is uh, produced from renewable energy sources like geothermal sources. So there we are blessed. So we don't need to use fossil fuels for that. But fossil fuels are still used in, in transport, in fisheries and agriculture. So the aim is to decarbonize uh, those sectors. And of course, in all of this, I mean, there must be financing, uh, not just the public, but the private sector must also engage. Um, so what we are now doing is we're focusing on making the transportation system greener. And here's where the state can come in, because with tax incentives, you can encourage people to buy uh, clean cars. So for example, now in, uh, uh, people uh, have responded to this and we have the world's second highest share of electric cars. So almost 50% of all new cars registered in Iceland last year were 
in fact, electric cars. So, which is which is very important. Um, and uh, actually, uh, no fossil fuel cars will be uh, allowed after 2030, or no new, you know, registration of new cars. But cutting emissions in, is not enough, as we all know, to 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 reach our goal of carbon neutrality by by 2040. We must do more, and we also need to remove carbon from the atmosphere. And so, what we in Iceland have been doing is is focusing on on nature-based solution, such as as I mentioned, afforestation and land and wetland restoration. But we have also been developing a carbon capture and storage solution. It's called CarbFix, and I actually had a very good meeting with these people uh, this morning, and they turn carbon dioxide into minerals in basaltic rock and it has apparently enormous capacity and this is something that we're also going to discuss uh, here in the US of if this this method is applicable here. So it it will be able to bind all the carbon from heavy industry in Iceland and uh, is now also working on solutions to get carbon from other countries in Europe and turning it into minerals in Iceland. So it's basically turning CO2 into stone deep under the Earth's surface. So it's a great solution. Um, but of course, it, it, it needs um, investment, not only, I mean, it in, 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 especially in science and, and, and development of, of innovative solutions. So, I mean, this takes a lot of effort um, from from both uh, the science sector, but also from the government and from the private sector, because you know financing is key here. So I'm about to reach the end of my remarks, but I would just want to say, because we are here at the Howard University, that it's so important that young people get engaged, and uh, we have seen uh, uh, young people's movements across the world to have raised their voices and demonstrating for some months now. Uh, striking, striking for the climate. I mean, Greta Thun Thunberg is, of course, a famous person, but, but it's just so uh, important that we all do our share and that that we push our governments to to do better, to to build back greener. And uh, you know, we need to build the green well-being economies, and we need to look, take a hard look at ourselves and the way we have been consuming up till now, because we need to tackle the climate crisis for the well-being of future generations um, you know be it uh, you know we can plant trees instead of burning forests and and we can use nature-based solutions to say soak up carbon or whatever um, i actually have a 16 year old son and i tell him when i see him throwing away plastic into the you know the the normal bin and i scold him and he says mom whatever i do i mean it's the big companies that need to do their share and of course he's right but still we all need to change the way our habits and and the way we we consume and and live on this planet so that's all for me thank you so much well thank you madam ambassador for your very informative uh, remarks uh, and uh, uh, we will open the floor now to uh, some questions uh, I do have a question uh, for you, and this is uh, regarding communication, regarding uh, um, uh, how do we uh, let this message uh, come across? Because you have, on the other hand, the climato-sceptics who, uh, who have their own communication machinery, so to speak. And uh, so the, the issue is, is it an issue, and I will pose it this, this way, is it an issue of communication with regards to changing the habits of people? Sure. Uh, well, um, when you talk about the skeptics, what I have to say is that um, there are those who believe that the earth is still flat. <laughs> and... Uh, so I, I don't think we should be really wasting time on, uh, on uh, trying to prove that uh, science is real. And uh, even those who believe the earth is flat, when they break a bone, they're still going to the hospital to get treated. So I think we should be focusing on our efforts and accelerating our efforts to, uh, to 
address the real challenges we face in um, in um, bringing the emissions down in uh, mitigation efforts and adaptation efforts, mobilizing financing, and of course, uh, mobilizing more political will. What uh, what uh, Ambassador from Iceland said about uh, throwing the paper in the bin or plastic in the bin and with your son, what uh, it, it really brought me to thinking about individual apathy. Uh, I honestly believe that individual apathy is not the greatest threat to climate change. And uh, I know some probably uh, think otherwise, but I think uh, we are at a point where it is not individual apathy, but it is we, we need bigger shifts in systems and policies to make to get us to pass the goalpost to get us to one to ensure that we stay below 1.5 degrees that we are 100% decarbonizing by 2050 so uh, i think in order to make these big policy shifts we do need a revolution like uh, the greta thunberg movement like uh, the young generation that has really stepped up to the plate and organized and we need more mobilization of young people and i am so privileged to be addressing to some of the greatest minds in uh, in, in the world at the Harvard University today. And I hope all of you who are listening to me today can hear this message that you are really the change makers and you have the ability to bring real, real changes. And if we are able to mobilize all the young people to bring this political, uh, to put this political pressure to bring the shift that we need in policies, I think we are on the right track. Thank you. Ambassador Elert Dotel, if you want to uh, answer that question as well. I, I just thought my colleague answered it perfectly. I, I, I don't think we should be spending too much time <laughs> on a few skeptics. Um, I mean, it's different from one country to other. If you, if, for example, in Iceland, if you ask people, I don't think you will find any, find any skeptics. I mean, people see it, they know. Um, you can maybe, people can, uh, can quarrel about, you know, any previous ice ages or what have you, you know, but, but, you know, the facts are quite clear if you want to see them. And I don't think the ones that don't want to see them now will want to see them tomorrow, whatever happens. So I fully agree with my colleague. And I also agree with her that what we need is a huge shift in mentality and how, and of course the governments and the UN, I mean, need to lead this. Uh, but, but the young people, they can, they can surely push it, you know, so, so I, I can just, echo all what she said. Okay. Well, uh, the public uh, that is uh, uh, attending this uh, uh, conference can also ask a question. So you can either raise your hand and we will give you the floor, or you can put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, I have uh, one question though about uh, the interest, the interest of large corporations. Uh, the interests of large corporations sometimes are at odds with um, the uh, uh, with those of us uh, with the interests of those of us who are trying to uh, have a cleaner planet. Okay? Uh, so, and sometimes those the same uh, corporations are the ones uh, funding. Uh, uh, campaigns and so forth, uh, electoral campaigns. So uh, th there, there is a clash between interests on one hand and uh, really having a, a clean planet. Uh, so uh, how can we impart that uh, to the uh, to, to the corporations, the, the politicians? Uh, that's uh, that's my question. If I may start, I mean, I, I think uh, with, with large corporations, uh, I mean, they do what is in their interest. And I think more and more it's getting very clear that it is in their interests of how the public perceives them. And, you know, uh, you, you see it, the big oil companies, they are doing all sorts of things with, you know, they are, they are, yet, 
developing a new kind of, you know, energy, be it wind or solar or whatever. I mean, so I, I think it's like with smoking, you know, nobody smokes now, nobody wants to be seen smoking. And, and these big companies, they will, they need to, they will see the light. It's in their own interest to act in a positive way towards the, uh, towards the environment and, and climate change. I mean, you know, I, I think without, without uh, ch changing their kind of, or having their own shifts, I don't think they will survive. And uh, actually, if, if you look at the world, sometimes I feel that it is, it is even these big companies who are leading and developing, you know, new uh, ways, uh, new energy uh, and, and, and new uh, processes and all of that, more than governments. I feel that governments are sometimes lacking behind more than you see these uh, private companies. So, but, but, I, but I think in the end, no one will be able to stand outside this or, or act in an in a environmentally climate destructive way. Ambassador, thank you so much, Ambassador Elof Stotir. Ambassador uh, Hussein, do you have an uh, answer for us with regards to uh, interest and how interest sometimes, uh, big interest, <laughs> big money, so to speak, is at odds with uh, a cleaner climate, a cleaner uh, planet? I think uh, the, 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 the vested interest of corporations, we're talking about vested interest of corporations here and lobbyists that uh, really influence, uh, try to influence the government policies through campaign contributions and various other means in some countries have uh, stricter measures to, to minimize this uh, influence and others have weaker systems. But uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, the power really lies with the people and this again brings me back to the uh, to uh, to uh, to the uh, to the power of organizing, and if uh, the politicians do what their constituents ask them to do, so if it is important, uh, I think, for our movements, the climate movements, to organize ourselves in a way that uh, we elect people who can implement cli uh, strong climate policies. And uh, the, so I think voters have a lot of power and uh, we, we see that shift happening in many parts of the world. And uh, so if uh, the constituents, if uh, we as voters can organize ourselves in a way to, uh, to tell up the politicians, to tell the people who we elect to the office that these are the policies that we want and that's what's going to happen. So I think uh, we underestimate the power we have as, uh, as voters. Thank you very much. We have a couple of questions from the uh, from the audience here. So one question is, um, if, for example, you had your choice, what else would you have uh, added to the Paris Accords? Or is the Paris Accord, are the Paris Accords uh, sufficient? Or is there anything that you think is missing there that you would have added? Do you want to go first or should I go? <laughs> you, you, I, I'm sure we agree on this, isn't it? <laughs> that, uh, yes, that this I, is voluntary and it's not, you are not punished if you do not do what you're supposed to do. <laughs> well, um, Paris Agreement, I think, um, I think Paris Agreement is a very, very strong and important step forward, but we have to recognize that it is a political compromise mm -hmm. and it is a first step forward. The, the, the Paris Agreement sent a very strong political message to the private sector and to investors. And uh, since the adoption of Paris Agreement, we have seen uh, a remarkable increase in mobilization of resources towards uh, research and development and uh, towards renewable energy, which is uh, helping us uh, make the shift towards a green economy. But uh, what uh, is adopted in the Paris Agreement on paper is, of course, not enough. It is not enough at all. 
it has we it has a two degree target and 1.5 as an aspirational goal and uh, we we have to make sure 1.5 is not an aspirational goal it is the target that we want to achieve if we do not achieve the 1.5 degree target we cannot ensure the survival of small countries like the Maldives so it is of utmost important that uh, we 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 look at Paris Agreement as a starting point from where we would be building up. Uh, even when you look at the mitigation, the uh, the structure of the Paris Agreement, uh, the bottom down uh, or bottom up uh, commitment models uh, that is in place, uh, the uh, the financing, uh, fi fi how the finance would be mobilized. So let's just say Paris Agreement, I believe, is a starting point and a very very good starting point, uh, which has shown global political commitment and will, and uh, from. From here, we need to really take the torch and run. Ambassadors, uh, Ambassador Elat Doter, would you like to answer that question? Uh, uh, there was, uh, this was such a perfect answer <laughs> that, that there is not much to add. I mean, it's when you participate in international negotiations and you are very ambitious, it is a frustrating process. But as Hussein said, Ambassador, she, I mean, it is a first step. And even, and I also have the feeling that even in 2015, when this was finalized, the urgency was not as great as it is now. Uh, and also the um, uh, commitment of the private sector, as was mentioned, but also the, um, the kind of the awareness of the broad public was was not already there. I think a, a lot has changed in to, since 2015. So hopefully Glasgow, you know, will bring more commitments and, and you know, but uh, I, I, definitely this was a great success. And, and therefore we also, because uh, the US needs to be on board, which it was, and, and it was even, I think it was Kerry as a secretary of state who signed the accord at the time. And um, it's good to see him now leading, uh, leading the US on, on this front. So I, I'm optimistic, optimistic that even if not every, uh, you know, it did not uh, fulfill the most ambitious goals, but it was definitely, it, it is a step forward. And we have, thank you so much, uh, Madam Ambassador. We have another question from uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Uh, Cheryl Gittens Bailey, who, is, uh, who happens to be one of the board members of uh, the advisory board of the Women Ambassadors Foundation. And her question is, is Iceland involved with any climate change projects in Africa? Uh, yes, we are actually. I mean, climate change has now, I mean, we have, in our development cooperation, we always have had gender as the most important factor um, in in our in our projects in in Africa, and but now added on top of this, we have climate. So a lot of the projects we are, I was just seeing some projects the other day, I think in Malawi, but but definitely uh, we are, and we have also been working a lot uh, in in seeing if if the use of geothermal energy. It's possible in, in some parts of Africa. And this we have been uh, developing uh, with, with countries. So, so I can just say that, uh, that climate change has become kind of one of the top priorities in all our development cooperation. Maybe I should group the questions. There is another question also about uh, cars. And that question is about uh, uh, why uh, why are the uh, cars uh, that are in um, uh, in auto uh, in the showrooms in auto shows always in the showroom of uh, car dealership always at the back of the of the showroom? Uh, it seems as though the uh, car industry doesn't want uh, to uh, highlight cars with low carbon emissions. <laughs> that was another question. <laughs> So um, ideal Paris Agreement. So we don't live in an ideal world, but hypothetically speaking, if we did have an ideal Paris Agreement, I would say that uh, ideal pa Paris Agreement would be a commitment to uh, 1.5 degree uh, centigrade to limit the gro global temperature 
below one point, well below one one point five degrees Celsius, it would have a commitment to hundred percent decarbonization by twenty fifty. It would have uh, financing earmarked fifty uh, percent for adaptation, fifty percent for mitigation. It would address loss and damage. It would address gender financing in a m much more streamlined manner. Uh, it would not have voluntary con contributions. It would have mandatory uh, mandatory uh, emission reduction targets, mm -hmm. not voluntary targets. So that, uh, and each country would uh, be, uh, it would lay out how much each country would be reducing. Uh, and, uh, and there would be a measuring and reporting mechanism where, uh, where it would the information would be publicly available to see where the targets are and how well the countries are doing in meeting their uh, targets and uh, and I, I don't want to talk about the justice aspect of it but uh, I think an ideal Paris agreement would also have a climate justice component attached to it and uh, it would have um, a component where if you don't meet the target, what would be the repercussions uh, uh, that would uh, be in place? So yeah, so the, that, the, that, that would be uh, our aspirations. And that would be like what we ideally would like to have in a perfect world. But, uh, but we don't live in a perfect world. And I think uh, what uh, we can do and what we should be doing is uh, keep these aspirational goals as goals that we really want to achieve and things that we really want to accomplish and find ways to mobilize the private sector, more, mobilize the youth movements, mobilize the, uh, raise more awareness uh, around climate change and uh, heighten the interest of the public so that it becomes an election issue in every and each country so that the politicians would be committed at the highest level and we would have the highest political will to achieve these goals and targets. Ambassador Elos Dutter? Yeah, maybe since uh, my colleague answered the ideal Paris Accord question so well, I'll just take the, the car one. <laughs> um, I, I actually, I never go to car shows. I'm not very interested in cars, so I wouldn't know if they're in the front or in the back. But if they're in the back, that is definitely a problem because you should be pushing these cars uh, to people. And as I said, I mean, there are ways of doing this. Like, like in Iceland, we have tax incentives. So people who buy cars uh, driven by uh, electricity, uh, you know, they, they come with a less of cost to you than, than if you buy a fossil fuel driven uh, driven car so so i think uh, i just think if if there is a show and the, the electric cars are in the back i mean that is a very outdated show in my mind and i i don't think you will see that much more in the future i think everyone wants to be on top of that i mean you've seen these there has been some i think it was general motors with will farrell what was doing these advertisement on how Norway beat them to the, you know. So, I mean, I think this this is just a sign of the awareness of the big car companies kind of seeing the light in a way. So I think the electric cars will get their right place in the front. Thank you so much. And now there's uh, one more question. I believe it's the last question. Uh, it, it's uh, more personal. It's what experiences uh, in uh, this question comes from Dariona Davis. And uh, her question is, what experiences in organizing, mobilizing, and police policy development did you have that led you to your current role as ambassador? Well, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, say experiences in mobilizing and all that, but let me put it this way. Uh, let, let me address this question uh, from a different angle. What I want is, uh, is that uh, in the Maldives, we have a homegrown democracy. So uh, the story of the homegrown democracy in the Maldives, I think is a story that we can draw parallels from uh, for the climate movement. Uh, for, the, for 30 years, we had a dictatorship in the Maldives where uh, the, the regime, were, uh, it was an authoritarian uh, regime in place. And uh, it was a grassroots movement that mobilized and organized and uh, uh, 
coordinated uh, that uh, that brought democracy to the Maldives, and it was the uh, it was the uh, the the hairdressers and the coffee shop owners, the youth activists and doctors and teachers. It was a range of people from range of uh, professions who decided that we want a country that is democratic, that respects human rights, that has good governance, and uh, we, we do not, and we have freedoms and that we have media freedoms and that we can speak out and then uh, so we, we, it was the people of the Maldives who decided that this is not the country that we wanted during uh, the authoritarian rule. We wanted a different country and we were able to bring that democracy by through a peaceful organization pro uh, pro process uh, by mobilizing people and by organizing and uh, through ballot boxes. We had an election where we changed the government. 2008, we had the first democratic government in the Maldives. And uh, since then, uh, we have had challenges, but uh, we are now back on the right track. And I think, and this is why uh, I think even the climate movement, if we can organize ourselves worldwide, like the Maldives did in the small country, we can bring, uh, we can bring shifts in policies and we can bring more political will to, uh, at a global level to address climate change. I will end with that. Thank you. I must say I admire my colleague very much from the Maldives and, and this, this kind of very um, uh, good uh, kind of story of how democracy came up, came, uh, 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 came apart on, on in, in the Maldives. I think it's a it, it's a lesson to us all, I think. Um, I, I mean, I, I come from a very, I mean, I come from a, we are privileged in Iceland. So we have the, one of the oldest democracies in the world and, and we feel, you know, speaking your mind and, and uh, mobilizing or, you know, having influence in the government, even, you know, running for, for political position yourself. I mean, that is something is, that you feel is given, but it is, but it is very, very precious. So I, I, I think we should just, uh, and, and our planet is precious. And I, I think this, this, uh, this story of mobilizing everyone to a better goal, I think that's just such a good way of, of, of ending this conversation today. So, so thank you so much. The, there, there was one more question. Uh, how has climate change affected uh, such natural wonders? Uh, talking about the golden uh, um, F. if I pronounce it correctly, um, such natural wonders as your blue lagoon and your marvelous sun that seems to set uh, at around 1 a.m. and pop up again shortly. Uh, this is a question from Dr. Jean Purchase-Tolok. I think, Dr. Jean Purchase-Tolok, your question refers to uh, Iceland, right? Do you want to add anything to that, Ambassador Elot Zothier? No, just thank you very much for this beautiful description. Um, but the, uh, the Blue Lagoon is still there, but it's very close to the volcanic eruption. So it has been closed because it be, can be quite dangerous to, to bathe in it at the moment. So. But that's not climate change. But as I mentioned earlier, um, the most visible effects of climate change in Iceland is the melting glaciers. Mm -hmm. And we are a country of fire and ice, but I fear that even in 100 years, we may not have any glaciers anymore. If, this, if we cannot, cannot get the global warming down, as my colleague said, to even below 1.5, you know, then then we will have a totally different countries in just 100 years. So it will, yeah. Okay, well, uh, I just want to thank profusely Madam Ambassador, uh, Madam Ambassador Stelniza uh, uh, Hussein from the Maldives and Madam Ambassador uh, Bergdis Elert Zotir uh, from Iceland. I hope that I pronounced both of your names correctly. <laughs> yes. And uh, I, uh, this was really a pleasure to have both of you uh, commenting on uh, 
climate change. Uh, for the public, I would say that if you want to find out more about the, the um, uh, career of both ambassadors, you can go to our website, which is www.womenambassadors.net. And uh, you, will, you can click on their photo and you will uh, uh, get more information about uh, their, their previous posts, uh, their previous postings. So again, thank you uh, so much uh, for your very extremely informative uh, session. Thank you very much, Madam Thank Amanda. you. Thank, thank you, you Marilyn, and thank you, Burgess, uh, for for the for this uh, very uh, insightful discussion and for this opportunity. And uh, as we today is also we are today we are concluding our commission on status of women. The discussions we have had two weeks of productive discussions. So I want to conclude uh, by emphasizing that uh, women and girls who make up half the population have immense untapped potential to address climate crisis also. Our mission must be to empower them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to both ambassadors.